Praise the Lord. Are we together? Are you willing to lose it? Why don't you raise up your hand? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time because of these wonderful things we're hearing. Bless your people even tonight in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind to us. The things we knew before remind us. And what we don't seem to know, emphasize to every one of us in Jesus' name. Bless us, Lord, and give us the grace, the heart, the mind, the commitment to be able to follow through and be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. And you'll confirm your word in our heart, in our lives. And when we go to declare the word, you follow with signs following. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see now we come to some serious, serious matters. Because of the world in which we live. And because of the various countries we come from. And because of the challenges we face. And because of what we know presently of the various things all over the world. And we are gathered together from various nations. And while you are here and you are reading the papers, you might be finding out some things that are taking place in the countries you come from. And yet, the Lord is telling us, there are some things we need to do. And there are some things we need to put in place. And there is a kind of obedience we need to manifest in the community. Responsibility for the believer. We're looking at the believer's responsibility. In his community and in his country, whatever the country is, and whatever their form of government is, and whatever the style, lifestyle of the leadership in those countries, whatever they are, this is quite challenging, and this is quite instructive, and this is going to be, you know, you're going to have, need the grace of God. And the choice of the Lord and the revelation of the Lord to be able to swallow, to be able to obey. Look at Titus chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Put them in mind. That simply means remind them to be subject to principalities and powers and to be magistrates and to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse laws and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You will not know the depths of those words until you look at the background of what we're reading. Here Paul the Apostle talking about the governments of the world. And talking about the principalities, the principles in the cities. The principalities is not talking about powers of darkness. It's talking about the principles in the cities, principalities. Talking about the leaders, the government, the governors, the kings, the rulers, those principalities and the powers. That is, those who hold the power over the people. That's what it means there. The people that are ruling. And they have the power, the authority to direct those nations. And then he talks about the magistrates. You understand, even in the, in the presidential system or parliamentary system, you'll have the president. Then you have the vice president and then the next person is the one in charge of the judiciary, the magistrates. And he's talking about the top echelon of the government. And he's saying, we put you in mind. He's saying, we remind you that you'll be subject unto those principalities and the powers and the magistrates to be ready 
to every good work. And it shows that actually the scripture is inspired. And I'll show you why. If you know the treatment that Paul the apostle had received in the hands of those principles of the cities, principalities, in the hands of those that had the power to rule and to control. If you know what Paul the apostle had gone through, the injustice, the ill treatment that Paul the apostle had gone through, under those leaders of those gentle nations. And then he's still saying, apart from what I've suffered, apart from the pressure, apart from the injustice, apart from the ill treatment, apart from even binding me when they have not examined me, all the same, in spite of all that, be obedient unto those leaders of those nations. I'm going to show you Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And have that in your mind. The background. That even though Paul the Apostle went through all this. He still said. Yes I'll remind you. This is the will of the Lord. We have suffered under their hands. But this is the will of the Lord. This is the wisdom of God. He instituted a government. Otherwise, there'll be confusion, there'll be division, there'll be anarchy. Otherwise, human life will not matter at all. Uh, you know, animals will treat one another, just destroy one another. The same thing in society. If we say, because the governor of that state is like this, and because the president of this country is like this, and because the judiciary is like this, then we take laws into our hands. Well, wipe out civilization. Well, wipe out the countries. But Paul the Apostle said, don't even mind what they have done to me. But we're going to put you in mind to be subject unto the principalities, unto the powers, and to obey the magistrates so that you'll be carrying out the will, the word of God. We're looking at um, Acts chapter 16, verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates, you remember that's what he mentioned in Titus, the magistrates have said to let you go now. Therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They are beating us openly uncondemned being romans and they have cast us into the prison and now do they trust us out privily nay verily let them come themselves and fetch us out the point is this they didn't find paul the apostle guilty they didn't even examine him they didn't investigate the case just because some mob shouted, they beat him with silence and they threw them into jail. Now where they were in their offices, now they remember those men, we shouldn't have treated them like that. We didn't even examine them. This is injustice. Instead of apologizing to them, they just said, okay, let them go. And Paul said, but look at the way they have treated us. They same Paul. Who had suffered injustice and ill treatment. He said, Titus, don't worry about how bad the government of the world is. Put our members, the body of Christ, put them in mind. And tell them to be subject unto principalities and powers. I was uh, having a program in a particular country. And as I was having that program there, one of our leaders there in Nigeria. He said publicly, and he said, if the government does this, I will pray and I will tell the Lord this. I called him privately. I said, don't ever say that in the public again. Don't even say that in the private. You know, as we are children of God, whatever the government does, whatever ill treatment, whatever injustice, we still need to understand where to be subject unto the principalities and the powers. And we cannot, we cannot come out and say the government has done this. As, yes, we know a lot of things they do. But even then, 
the scripture says was still to be subject unto them. Look at chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 12. Acts chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 12. Here it says, And when Galil, Galil was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. Uh, look at a person, a magistrate who was in charge, and he came to report a case. And he said, I don't have time to deal with such a thing. And there was trouble. And they wanted to lynch Paul. But all the same, the fellow just said, I don't want to care about that kind of thing. And then he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks, two sustainers, and the chief ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared for none of those things. Insecurity. In the land. That the life of Paul was not secured. And the, the man, Galio did not worry. Did not mind. Even if they were lynched, the man there. And it's the same Paul. That saw their injustice. And saw their carelessness. And saw that they didn't have value for life. Or value for the rights of the citizens. He said, Titus, yes, we know. Those governments, they are not what they ought to be. But... Two wrongs will not make a right. They are wrong. We still have to keep right. And they are evil. We still have to be good. Put them in mind that they should be subject to those same governments of that land. Chapter 22 of Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 22. Acts 22 verse 22 And they gave him audience unto this word Then lifted up their voices and said Away was such a fellow from the earth For it is not fit that he should live As they cried out and cast off their clothes And threw dust into the air The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle And bade them that he should be examined by scourging he had not done anything wrong. He should be examined by scourging. They said, tie him to the pole and beat him very well. And when you beat him and you give him black eye, then ask him, are you a criminal? Almost anybody will say, apart from Paul, yes, I'm to, to get free from the beating, will say, okay, whatever you said I've done, I've done. So I can stop beating me. Beat him. Scourge him. And then after you scourge him, examine him. That's he, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him and as they bound him with tongues Paul said unto the centurion that stood by is it lawful is this according to law are we not being lawless here? you are trying to keep the law and is this lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman uncondemned and see the ill treatment they gave him. And yet, when he wanted to tell Titus what to preach, the doctrine, he said, don't change the doctrine because I'm being ill treated. Don't change the conviction because there is injustice. Put them in mind that they are to be subject unto the higher powers. And you will understand then, you know, sometimes when I come in here and I say, respect our leaders. Our state overseers, our region overseers, and respect our leaders who are here at the headquarters church. Some of you might shake your head and say, the GS does not know what we know. What do you know? What have they done? See Paul. See the ill treatment. And see the injustice. And with all that injustice, yet Paul the apostles said, put them in mind. Until we are not the people to remove state of a seer or remove a region of a seer. That's not in our hands. And Paul, even Paul the apostle, he wasn't the one to remove these magistrates. 
And he didn't go outside campaigning for, you know, journey politics to remove them because they're doing this and doing that. All he all knew is that whatever the injustice, whatever the lawlessness, whatever the unlawful things they were doing against him, this is the watch of the Lord. And that's what I declare to you and I hold it as, you know, the, I already, you saw it in the outline. I've been teaching you that the church is the greatest institution and the church is greater than the world in the mind of God. And the leadership in the church is greater than the leadership of the world in the mind of God. And if with all the injustice, until a state of Assyria is removed, whatever you think you know, and whatever anybody is telling you behind, look at this and look at this and look at this. Whatever they tell you, you are not the people to remove them. You didn't appoint them. You'll still be obedient. They're still your leaders. Until if God wants it done for this or for that, for them to, you know, go outside and pray a little bit, anybody. But, you know, if, uh, with all that we're hearing, we're praying that uh, the uh, state of us, yes, they'll be solid and stable. And that God will keep them in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. You see, we still have to be obedient. And well, not say, okay, but yes, we know what Jesus is saying. We know what he's preaching. But it's not like, it's not for this kind of person. It's not for this kind. Look at this in the Bible. And look at all these magistrates. And look at what he did. And yet Paul, the apostle said, Titus, tell everybody, tell those people, put them in mind. That they're going to be subject to the principalities and the powers. And to be obedient unto the magistrates. That they will be obedient. Be the word, the law of the country. They will not be lawless. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 22. In Acts chapter 24, verse 22, here it says, And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ and as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered go thy way for this time when i have convenient season i will call for thee listen to verse 26 he hoped also that money should have been given him of paul that he might lose him wherefore he sent for him the offner and communed with him isn't that what we see in our countries he was thinking that Paul, he, he, since he had been bound, and he knew that Paul was not guilty, that Paul was not a criminal, and they bound him, they made him a prisoner. And then he was hoping that Paul will talk to his friend and contribute money and give unto him. And because Paul will not give him money, he left him bound. And yet, that man that suffered that injustice, bound. I will not give bribe. He said, Titus, don't worry about what they do to us. We still have to obey the commandments of the Lord. And the commandment of the Lord is that we should obey. We should not be lawless. You put them in mind to be obedient unto the magistrates and to be subject unto the principalities and the powers. And now as you are studying the word of God, you now see the revelation of the word of God. Here is the word of God. And this is what what you do. In whatever country we live, we live in. Whatever the corruption there, you might just say, find out now in one of the countries in East Africa. I don't want to mention the country, but you'll know the country. They just did an election. And then they said, this is the person that came in. And then they have sworn in the president already. And then the opposition is saying, no, cannot be. And it's rioting. And they're killing one another. If you are in that country, you cannot join them. And you cannot come to church and say, church, 
see this kind of election. I've read about all those results. And this is rigging. Classical rigging. You cannot say that. Don't get involved. And never say. Because that man they put there on the throne. As the president. Because we know all the details. It is rigging. And therefore you say. Will make the country ungovernable for them. You cannot do that. Because even though we know the injustice is there in the world, do they have grace? Do they have holiness? Are they filled with the Holy Ghost? Is Christ living in them? Is the government of the world? But all the same, they keep the law and the order to some extent. And they still keep things running to some extent. And you are here. You are not a citizen of this place. You are a citizen of heaven. You are a foreigner. Even though it's in your country. You are foreigners. This is not your land. We are going to another country. And while you are a foreigner here. Be subject to the principalities and the powers. And then you are obedient to those majesties. No, don't, don't worry about you. Hey, that election was rigged. This and this. Never even talk about that. That's not your concern. Never get involved with that. Daniel did not get involved with how Nebuchadnezzar became a king in Babylon. That wasn't his problem. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not get involved. How Nebuchadnezzar took over. That wasn't any concern to him. Don't get involved. And here it says in, in these Acts of the Apostles that we're reading. Chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 23. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come. And Benaisi with great pomp and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us. You see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me. Both at Jerusalem and also here crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death. He had committed nothing worthy of death. And it is let him bound. And he himself confessed to his colleagues in the government that he had done nothing worthy of death. And that he himself has appealed to Augustus. I have determined to send him. But he said he had committed nothing worthy of death. Of whom I have no certain, no certain thing to write unto my Lord. That's unto Caesar, unto Augustus Caesar. Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you. And especially before the old king Agrippa. That after examination, arch, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner. And not without to signify the crimes laid against him. That is, I cannot find anything to write. The man appears to be innocent and yet will leave him bound. And Paul the Apostle suffered all that injustice. But when he was going to preach in the epistles, in Romans, in Titus, he said, Tell our people, tell our people not to look at the injustice of a land, just to become just to be law abiding, just to be obedient, just to be loyal, just to be faithful, and to have the heart, the mind of Christ. That will not defend himself, but just live by the word of God. And you know, as we are here, and the, our members do not, they are not hearing what we are hearing. And you know, sometimes from what I observe and what I see, even some of our, you know, young, young members, they don't respect the leadership of the church. I mean, uh, you know, our overseers and our, you know, local government uh, pastors, you go back home and you, in, they gossip and they say, you know, this, this and this. I'm not here to tell whether those things are right or wrong, what they're saying. Since I'm not in your state, I'm not in your nation. I don't know whether those things are right or wrong. But the point is this, as long as that leader is still the leader there, as long as that leader is still the leader there, go back and talk to the members. Don't talk again like that against our leader. Don't talk again like that against our overseer. Don't talk again, again like that against the local pastor here. So that we'll be obedient to the watch of God. Two wrongs will not make a right. 
If we do something that God will say yes, even though what you said was true, but your action was wrong, even though those magistrates and those principalities and those powers, even though they are wrong, what you said was not right. And so you need to understand that the word of God commands us. And it says, this is the way to live. That's the way we're going to live. I said that's the way we're going to live. Chapter 26 of Acts of the Apostles. Paul, the apostle, went through a lot. He went through a lot. And yet, he did not allow what he had gone through to change the doctrine or to change his obedience to the word of God. He knew government, leadership, administration of a country, of an organization, of a church is established by the Lord. The individuals who occupy those places, they may have their problems, but you respect the country. You respect the administration and you respect the institution of the Lord. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 29. Acts 26 verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, King Agrippa, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am, except these bounds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up. And the, and the governor and Benaisi and they that sat with them and when they were gone aside they talked between themselves saying this man doeth nothing worthy of death or worthy of bonds yet they bound him they themselves confessed internally among themselves they went aside they whispered to themselves this man has done nothing worthy of death and worthy of bounds. And Paul had a clear conscience that he was all right. And yet they bound him. And yet, even though he knew he was suffering unjustly, when it comes to standing on the demand of God being lawful, not lawless, law-abiding, he said, Put them in remembrance that they will be subject to principalities and powers and to be these magistrates who are ill-treating me. We're looking at Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 17. In verse 17, Acts chapter 28, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He said, I've committed nothing, neither against the moral law, the Jewish law, the national law, whatever, and yet they handed me over to the Romans, and now I, I, I'm, I'm in prison. I lose my liberty. I cannot be where I want to be, when I ought to be there, and yet, even though he knew that, he said, tell them, tell our members, not to look at even what I'm suffering from the hands of those governments, and and tell them to be subject unto principalities and powers and to be obedient unto the magistrates. And that is the reason why we know that the scripture is inspired. If the scripture were not inspired, a man like Paul the apostle haven't suffered so much, he would have said, let them go to hell, go to pieces. That's why we know holiness is real. Holiness is real. With everything he had gone through, that mind of Christ, that humility and that honesty and that the obedience to the word of God is still kept to the word of God, not minding what he had suffered. And that's the same thing we're teaching here. We're saying, if we, if we mistakenly step on your toes, and if we kind of wrong you unconsciously, that doesn't excuse you not to obey us. You'll still obey. You'll still say, this is the word of God. You're not going to, you know, stand at the back over there and say, this decision of the state of Asia is wrong. This decision of the region of Asia is wrong. And before we even report the region of Asia to the state of Asia, we take the microphone away from his mouth. We take the pulpit away. We say, no. 
The chief city overseer is not doing his work. He's not moving around to examine and to oversee everything. You, you will not preach here. And then we'll begin to call them names. Then we're hearing information that in that particular region, this is the way they are treating the region overseer there. Then we'll say, why did you do that? Oh, they said, uh, we know his life. You cannot defend him. We know him very well. We're living here together. Whatever you know. Until the person who put him there also removes him. He's the only one that has the right, the authority to remove him. You are not the one that put him there. You still have to be obedient to the word of God. See what Jesus said. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Even though as Lord and Master, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he was still going to denounce the war unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Did you ever hear Peter repeat that warn to you, scribes and Pharisees? Never, never. And there are things in which you cannot copy Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings, He is the Lord of Lords. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, see what you have done. You are rotting on the inside. Outsidely, you profess to know God, but you are sepulchers. You have all these sepulchers, this rottenness coming out of you. And yet, He said, those scribes and Pharisees see it in Moses' seat. Everything they bid you do according to the word, obey. But they say and do not. You see how Jesus respected even the leadership of those Pharisees. Not born again. But when they read the Bible to you, until God removes them. That's what the Lord is telling us. I pray that this revelation the Lord is giving us will abide by it in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Now we're going to divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, several responsibilities of Christians in each country. Several responsibilities of Christians in each country. Number two, the speech of the righteous in the community. The speech of the righteous in the community. Number three, the saints' renunciation of old character. The saints' renunciation of old character. We come to number one. That is several responsibilities of Christians in each country. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Titus. Titus chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, we're looking at it from verse 1. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject. Let every soul, every soul, the ones who have suffered under that same government, the one who has been denied some rights under that same government, everyone, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, because God instituted the government. That's why it says that. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Proverbs chapter 24. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 21 and 22. Proverbs 24, verses 21 and 22. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. I told you earlier in one of the messages I've given here that from decade to decade, it appears that facts and fashions and cultures change. And it appears that, you know, the age in which we are living is the age of, you know, do your own thing. As if there were no king in Israel. As if there were no leadership in the land. And that's what the Lord is saying here through, uh, through Proverbs chapter 24 verse 21. Fear the Lord and fear the king. And meddle not with them that are giving to change. Those are the people that will say, well, we used to fear the king in the past. But now 
who is seeing our Solomon of all people and see what has happened, see what has happened. But he has not been removed. He has not been removed. And because he has not been removed, and don't meddle with the people that are given to change. The people that take laws into their hands and they feel that because of this, because of that, that's why we're rebelling. The sale should obey anybody like this. And who should be cooperating with anybody like this? Meddle not with them that are given to change for their calamity shall rise suddenly. And who knoweth the ruin of them? Both. And let's look at Matthew chapter 22 verse 15. Matthew chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 15. Here the Jews came. They came to ask Jesus this kind of question. Matthew 22 verse 15. Then when the Pharisees took and took counsel. How they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples. With the Herodians saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived the wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he says unto them, Whose image, whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then says he unto them, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. If you understand the background, this was the government, foreign government in the land of Israel. Foreign government in the land of Israel that wanted to kill Jesus Christ when he was born. Foreign government. This was this is the government that wanted to that killed all those little children. And you will think that Jesus will have a reason to say, huh, ah, you want to. If you want to give anything to Caesar, foreign government, don't you know you are covenant people? And the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, should you be overruled by any foreign government? But that was the government of the day at the time of Jesus. And Jesus just said, but you are spending their money. If you didn't submit to their rule, why would you mint your money and your coins and put their image there? Give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's in natural things, in day-to-day -day running of activities, in registering a company, in registering the church, in buying the land, in getting the C of O, and in building and uh, giving the building plan. You cannot have something of your all that is that's what they deal with, and then in running here and there and in settling things between your neighbors that's their duty allow them to do their duty and then of course your soul belongs to god your heart belongs to god and your com commitment loyalty as to salvation obedience to the word of god that belongs to god give unto god the things that are god's and unto caesar the things that are caesar's what if their commandments or whatever contradict the word of God? Then you take your stand. But even then, even then, when you take your stand, you'll be willing to suffer without reacting negatively. You'll be willing to suffer without mobilizing other people. You'll still obey the word of God. You'll still say, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. we rather obey God than men. If they put you in prison, as a result of that stand, you will not break the prison doors. You'll do like Peter under those two uh, guards. And then you'll be sleeping in the night that you'll eat the food there. That is the price you pay for giving unto God what belongs to God. You are not going to start any rebellion. You're not going to start any demolition of anything. Because you know you are in that land. And that's what the Lord is teaching us. Yes, obey the Lord, but you pay the price. And you, you submit to that persecution. And you live the life that is holy without ever saying anything wrong about the government of the land where you go to. Our missionaries need to understand that. You're not going there to correct their government. You're not going there to, you know, raise up a political party. You're not going there to say, no, this is wrong. I'm coming from Nigeria. 
Nigeria. In Nigeria, they won't take this from any government. The journalists were right and this were right. Are you a journalist? Are you not a missionary? What concerns you with the government of their country? Just stay there and preach the gospel and preach to everyone. And any, anywhere you go, any opportunity you have, you just, you know, you pray for them and all that. And when you pray like that, you, you need wisdom. Or oh, in you know in one of the countries in West Africa here, and uh, they, they you know after finishing the crusade, then they got me to uh, to see the president there, and the president there is not not even a nominal Christian, belongs to the other religion, and uh, the uh, the sister that arranged that uh, was saying when you get there, you you must pray for our country, you must pray for the president. Uh, I didn't answer her because I don't I don't impose myself on any government, and then we got there and you know he spoke and I spoke and we shared together just, just nice nice without knocking their government or knocking anything and then before we left I wanted to stand up and that sister was looking at me are you not going to tell the president that you want to pray for our country and I just said uh, you know looked away from her we were about to stand up and the president himself said please you'll pray for me you'll pray for my country you know, it came from him. And because it came from him, then I had the privilege of praying for him and praying for his country. I was in another country. And uh, that time, I didn't understand French. And uh, so, after we finished the crusade, I was to go and see the president. And uh, we got him there. And the president didn't want anybody from a national to follow me. That is to get in. And then we got in there. Good enough. At that time, our missionary there understands French very well. And being a Nigerian, he went in with me and uh, said some things. I could pick up some French at that time. Only I couldn't speak it at that time. And uh, after saying some things that he said, then I said some other things. And the man presently began to open up. He said, well, what are you going to tell me? I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And the, the missionary with me, he was surprised. As the president opened his mouth and began to confess that this and this, he needed forgiveness, he needed cleansing, he needed the help of God. And then we were able to talk about repentance, about the mercy of God, about salvation, and he prayed. When we came out of the office, then the missionary told me that he was surprised that that president has never opened his mouth to even the journalist to confess those things that he told me. You, you, you need to be wise. You need to be very wise that you are not going to any country or going to any president and trying to straighten them out. You keep your mouth shut. You are just to be a law-abiding foreigner while you are there. And even those of us who are citizens, you must be law-abiding that they will know that Christianity has changed you. You will not team up with the nationals in your country, even if you are national too, to kind of overthrow the government. If they call you, don't get involved with anything like that. Just say, oh, we're praying for you and we're praying for the government. Are you on their side? We're on the Lord's side, but you know, we love everybody. We are, to, you know, we are to just care for everybody. Those who are right and those who are wrong. And if you had been there, you had been the president, would you better than, would you do better than this present government? Just push it to them. Just say, we're praying for everybody. We're not involved. I'm not going to overthrow any government. Am I right? We're to preach the gospel to every creature. That's what the Lord is teaching us here. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God judge you, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Yes, they will speak the things they have heard and the things they have seen, but they will not teach anybody rebellion to overthrow the government of any country. I come to point number two. The speech of the righteous in the community. We're looking at uh, Titus chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 2. Titus chapter 3, verse 2. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawler, and to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. This is talking about our speech. This is one of the most neglected and most disobeyed commands in the Bible. Many 
people dig their graves with their tongues. And they drive themselves into damnation with their mouth. Evil speaking is speaking evil of an absent person. When somebody is absent and we're gossiping, slandering, criticizing, that is evil speaking, relating something evil, slandering a neighbor in his absence. Evil speaking has various forms and it takes the form of backbiting or tail bearing or whispering or slander or defamation or calumny. The true believer lives by the golden rule, doing unto others as he desires the other will do to him. Not as the others are doing to him, but as the others ought to do unto him. You don't treat people the way they are. You treat them as you want them to treat you, as they ought to be. And that means then that a true believer will not have any, any sin in his heart to want to hate others. You don't want them to hate you. You don't hate them. Or that will, that will do something that other people detest. Whatever you hate and detest, you're not going to do to other people. What he does not want others to do to him, he cannot do unto other people. As you would not enjoy others speaking evil of you, you yourself will not speak evil of anyone. We are not to say anything of anyone which will cause him emotional pain. Of physical injury. We are never to utter any sin that we know to be false about our brother, about our sister, about our neighbor, and or ever give such a coloring to his word. He said something. You want to repeat what he said, and you color it in such a way that you are giving a wrong impression about him. That's evil speaking. We shouldn't do that. It tells us in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, we're reading from verse 1. Speak evil of no one. Here David is asking a question from the Lord. And what's the question? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. Permit me again to remind you. I think as we look at our various families, if we will do what we do in church, do it at home, that will make the church to grow. What do we do in church? I, I think uh, every, every branch, that's what I suppose, when we meet on Sunday, and then during the time after start the scripture, there's then question and answer, and then there is congregational song. Then after that, we're going to pray, congregational prayer. Then we read uh, whatever testimony we have, whatever prayer request we have. Then we begin to pray. We pray for the church. We pray for all those who are ministry, officiating the choir, the ushers, and all the other workers who are helping us those we see and those we don't see we pray for them and then we say we're going to pray now for our state overseer we're going to pray now for our region overseer and we pray for them and then when we get back home if you sit with your wife on the table and while you are eating you don't have any other thing to discuss about but about state overseer about region overseer you just nullified the effect of the prayers you prayed in church if you're going to keep up the prayer you prayed in church then when you get back home, you also pray for them. And when you pray for them like that, God will know that the prayer you prayed in the church is genuine. It's real. But if we chew them with our meat, if we turn around at home and then husband and wife were discussing those leaders, how does that match what we did on Sunday morning? must be consistent with what we do. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, you'll not backbite. You're not even to backbite your neighbor. You're not to have tail bearing against even ordinary member. Even the sinners in the neighborhood were not to backbite and talk against them. How much more the leadership and it says in verse 3, He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. The Lord will help us. I said the Lord will help us. And we're going to be victorious in this area in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 3 verse 8. 
First Peter chapter 3 verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion, one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from the they speak no girl. Is that possible? It's possible for you, for me, for us all together. Now, we need to balance this up. Speak no evil of any man. And speak, uh, you know, what is right. Uh, correcting people. Uh, you know, uh, saying the right thing about people. It may be necessary sometimes. When we are called to state what we know about someone's character. Now you are called upon. To say what you know about somebody's character. And then you might have to say things that are not in that person's favor. The question is, if you have something negative that you have seen. And you are called upon. What do you know about this? And I say, Christian, you cannot tell a lie. And you are to say this, this and that. And that thing you are saying is not favorable. It's not a good thing. It's not a joyful thing. It's like an evil thing. But that fellow has done it. What do you do? Are you going to say speak evil of no man? Let's see. Titus chapter 1. Because you must read everything together. Connect everything. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert household houses, teaching things they ought not, for feel the Lucas sake. Verse 16, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him. That's, you know, that's saying something evil about them. But those evil things are true. But he's, he's not telling every neighbor. He's not making that his uh, conversation to everybody. He's telling the right person who can take action on those people who can stop their mouth. That's what he did. He wasn't saying this to Timothy because Timothy was in Ephesus. And talking about the people in Crete, that's not the concern of Timothy. Timothy had nothing to do with that. But Titus, he was there in church in Crete. And these people, Paul the Apostle, noticed something evil about them. And the person who could correct that evil scene, Paul the Apostle spoke to that person, to Titus, and never said anything about the Grecians to the Ephesians. That is how to balance it up. If you see anything that needs to be corrected, and then the person who is in position to correct it, you tell that person. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 19. First Timothy chapter 1. Reading from verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith, and have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is speaking evil of them, but the speaking evil, this is the, evil, the exact evil they had done. They overthrew the faith of other people, and then Paul, the apostle, said they had made shipwreck of the faith. Why was he telling Timothy? So that Timothy will know ahead of time. That's in, your, in, your, in the area of your ministry. Timothy, you need to know this. So and so, so and so. He mentioned them by name. He said, be careful, beware of those people. They have made shipwreck of the faith. That's, that's not speaking evil. In a sense, so speak evil of no man. He's talking about a normal conversation, a normal relationship, a normal interaction. But if there's somebody who is doing evil and he is evil will ruin the church destroy the church you will tell the Timothy who is the pastor there you'll tell the Titus who is the pastor there you're not going to tell what you need to tell Timothy you'll not tell Titus what I mean is this you're in a southern state and you're a member of that state in the south of Nigeria and you feel that you see something wrong that our pastor our leader there is doing 
Now, writing to somebody in the north, a member of the church in the north, what's that member in the north going to do about the things you are saying to him about your pastor in the south? He can do nothing. That's gossiping. Even in the south here, here you are in stage A. And then you say you see something wrong that the overseer of stage A is doing. Even if it's, you are right and that thing is wrong. And then you carry that thing and you go to tell the state overseer of stage B. What's he going to do about it? Does he have power to remove the overseer in stage A? He doesn't have the power. That's gossiping. You will tell the person, you will write to the person if the thing is very serious. And the thing can destroy the church. You will inform the person who has the authority to find out. And if he finds out, then to make the correction. Otherwise, we are mischievous. Just carry stories from this stage to that stage. And from this stage to that stage. And by the time we come to our program there. And I come and I invite people, you know, to come with me. We're going to this stage. And we're going to have maybe crusade or whatever. And I handpick, you know, some of, you know, my rantan people from either from Nigeria or from overseas. And then we come there. While I am busy preaching, you are busy going to them and telling them something. What are they going to do about it? That's not why I invited them to come with me. If you have anything to say, you know the right way to say it and the right source you need to say those things too all, all this confusion this is speaking evil God it will help us and we're going to correct it in Jesus name and hey, don't sow any bad sin because very soon you might become an overseer yourself because I'm seeing that God will promote you I said God will promote you and uh, you know we used to have only 12 uh, states and then 19 states and who knew at that time we we're going to go to 22 states and now 36 37 uh, you know who knows what will come again and it may come to your turn and if you do anything bad now to the people who are there whatever you sow don't say the rest just uh, god will forgive you <laughs> praise the lord you know, the Lord just wants us to love one another. And if, uh, even before you write, why don't you go to that overseer and say, Sir, with all due respect, we think that this, this, and this. Like, you know, like children talking to their parents. And then you want to resolve the thing, and the thing is corrected. Why do you need to still, you know, wake up the sleeping dog and bury that thing there? Once it's corrected, our purpose, our goal is to get things corrected. And once those things are corrected, why are we making noise about them? But if if you see that there's, there's, not, there's no correction and you see that the thing can ruin the church, you know that this, this will ruin the church, that's when you take the right step. And even then, once you've done that, you're not going to photocopy that letter you write and then give the ordinary members of the church and give coordinators in the church and give everybody your local church. That's destructive. God will save us and God will keep us in Jesus' name. In Second Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 1. In Second Timothy chapter 1, looking at verse 15, here it says, This thou knowest, that all they that are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom is jealous and homogeneous. You know, that, that's, that is not something evil they had done. It was telling Timothy, he said, Timothy, you need to put this on record. You need to put this on record because the, their false doctrine and their disloyalty may affect you. Be very careful. There's a time and there's a way to say those things if they're evil. And we know it will destroy the church, then we say them. In Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 16 But shun profane and vain babblings For they will increase unto more ungodliness And their word will eat as does a canker Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus Who concerning the truth have erred Saying the resurrection is past already over And overthrow the faith of some 
if somebody is doing something evil and it's not it's not because you had any personal business uh, relationship and then the fellow you thought cheated you not because of that but because this person what he's doing is going to make other people backslide and it will overthrow the face of other people of course you'll speak out at that time you'll not say speak ill of no man let him do evil let him preach false doctrine let him overthrow the face of other people there's nothing i'm going to do you need to do something when it comes to that let's look at third john third john i'm reading from verse nine that's the third epistle of john and we're looking at verse nine reading from verse nine to verse eleven i wrote unto the church but Diotrephus, who loved to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, preaching against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casted them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. Here is John the Beloved. This is the apostle of love. And he wrote to the church, by the way, please, can you look up here? You know, leaders are very different from one another. And I'm just, I'm just picturing now what John, the beloved here, is writing. He's writing to, you know, this uh, Gaius that, you know, we really don't know much about him. But he's writing to him, an important person in the church. And he felt, he knew that these girls needed this information so that he will not copy this Diotrephes. But then he said, we wrote to the church. And this man wanted to have preeminence among them. He received us not. Wherefore, when I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, preaching against us with malicious words. Not even content therewith, neither he himself will not receive us, and he forbiddeth them that would, and casted them out of the church. This was a usurper. I'm, I'm wondering now, your know, leadership styles are very different. I'm thinking of Paul the Apostle. He comes, he rides to the church, and there is one tridiotrephes, and he says, no, you'll not come in here. I don't think Paul will do like John has done. And you know, to, okay, you don't want me to go in. Okay, you want to possess the church. All right, bye bye, take care of them, and then go away. And then, even those who will receive, he said, if you receive John, that is John the apostle here, I'll cast you out of the church. And then John just said, I don't want trouble. And went, I'm, I'm imagining if it was Paul, where Diotrephes said, I fought for the lions in Ephesus. And then he'll come in there. And whatever you are going to do, if you are going to beat him or knock him, whatever, he'll get, you know, he wanted to get to the synagogue. And then his friends pulled him back and said, let me go and pray to them. Even when God said, don't go to Jerusalem, they'll kill you. He said, oh Lord, let me go. They know how I persecuted the Christians there. And if those Jews will not allow me in, I will still go and tell them And God said, Okay, I need somebody to tell them you want to go, you can go. And then he got in there and said, I don't care what they do. None of these things move me. That's Paul. I pray you'll be like that. But you know, we have to accept John the way he is. And John just said, you know, I wrote to the church. Diotrephes is there. He will not allow me to talk to the church. And those who wanted to accept, he drove them out. Don't be like that, girls. Make life easy for us. Not Paul. I said not Paul. Praise the Lord. You know, leadership styles are different. And when you see us with different, different styles, just that's the constitution the Lord has given us. That's the style the Lord has given us. Don't complain. Just say, praise the Lord for our pastors. I said, praise the Lord for our pastors. Now you say that, praise the Lord for your own overseer. Say, I praise the Lord for my own overseer. Now you say it from the bottom of your heart. Are you serious? Praise the Lord. You know, when you go back to your states and go back to the nation, to the continent, and to Europe, to America, to, you know, everywhere you've come from, the church will never be the same again in Jesus' name. 
why don't we come to point number three now the saints renunciation of old character we're looking at titus chapter three Titus chapter three and i'm reading there from verse three titus chapter three verse three for we ourselves also were sometimes disobedient i want you to learn the word word that's in the past tense we're no more like that this is what we were in the past we ourselves also were sometimes foolish were disobedient were deceived were serving diverse lusts and pleasures were living in malice and envy were hateful and hating one another i want to emphasize that word was so that you know we're no more like that now in fact why don't you look at some verses in ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 12 ephesians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 12 that at that time ye were past tense without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the commonwealth of prop from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now notice those two words but now we were like this but now we are now different and when you see that, you understand that things are different now. We're not what we used to be, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who are far off, who are far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 8. You look at the word were, then you look at but now. It says, For ye were sometimes darkness. That's in the past. But now are ye a difference has taken place, a total difference and a total change has taken place. This is what you were, and this is who you are now. But now are ye light in the Lord? Walk as children of light in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. What you were in the past and what you are now. Colossians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 7. Colossians chapter 3 verse 7. In the which ye also walked, that's past tense, sometime. When ye lived, that's past tense, in them. But now. Do you see that it's consistent? Here is what you were in the past. But now, here is what you ought to be today. But now, ye also put off all these anger and wrath and malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that she have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. A change has taken place. I pray pray that that change will be permanent in Jesus name. Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 6 from verse 20. It talks of what you were in the past but what you are now. Romans chapter 6 verse 20, but when ye were, that's past tense, ye were servants of sin. Ye were free, devoid of righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become the servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Things are different now. Christ has come to our hearts. What we used to do, we do them no more. Where we used to go, we go there no more. Our lifestyle in the past, everything has now changed. The Lord has brought us into fellowship with himself and fellowship with one another. And this new life, the Lord has implanted in our hearts. And this revelation the Lord is giving us in this conference, we're going to live by it in Jesus' name. And this work of the Lord will prosper in your hand. And then as you are doing the work, is prospering in your hand. The blessing of God will never leave your life and your family. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Thank him for what the Lord is revealing to us now. Beautifying our lives with this knowledge of the truth. 
planting his love in our hearts that now whatever country we come from and whatever is happening in that country will not be a party to any destructive action there will not be a party to any rebellious action there will not be a party to any rioting there we'll just uh, be praying for the country and then we'll keep on just doing our work evangelizing and doing what we need to do we'll be law abiding and even if we have suffered in the hands of, uh, you know, the uh, agents there, we're still going to be law-abiding and still tell our members, we're not going to tell our members to do anything negative to the government of the country we come from. And we're not going to speak in a derogatory manner to any gov about any government. You know, sometimes you read some things in the papers and uh, what they call some of the presidents in the papers. Well, those are journalists. That's their profession. You are not journalists. You are a Christian. You are ministers of God. And you are ambassadors of Christ. And you are not, you're not going to get into the name calling. And you're not going to come to the pulpit and be reading the polls, the GOP that they did on the president of that country on the administration of that country on this on that that's not your concern you're not preaching their statistics you're not preaching their results of the polls you're preaching christ and the whole world is your parish and all the people there all the sinners there whether the sinners are in office or, or they're out of office you are supposed to preach to them. If you criticize those sinners on your pulpit, how will you preach the gospel to them when you have the chance? Don't turn your pulpit to a kind of um, delivery for political addresses. Be law abiding. If we are to be so low abiding, I were to be subject to the principalities and the powers to be obedient to those magistrates, even when we know they have ill treated some of our relatives and they have been unjust to us and to some of our members, how much more are we to respect our leaders in the church? That will show the evidence of being born again and evidence of being belonging to the kingdom of God. That we don't take laws into our hands. That we are the people to discipline our pastors. We are the people to take the microphone away from our overseers. We are the people to ruin their reputation. We are the people to destroy their wives and their children by the talk of our mouths. For the people to threaten them and run them out of town to make them feel fearful and intimidated and frightened that they cannot do their work. I will say it doesn't fit, it's not fit to be there. I'll deal with him that he himself will not even have the courage to come and stand before us and be talking all the rubbish he wants to talk. You can't do that anymore. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you, Lord, because you are giving us the mind of Christ. And Lord, we receive that mind in Jesus' name. Where we have been wrong, O oh Lord, forgive every one of us. Cleanse your people with the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. And plant your love and your wisdom and your righteousness and holiness in every heart in Jesus' name. We have, we have hurt your work because of the way we have acted to the leadership. Oh Lord, forgive us and help us now from today to have the respect and the honor and the submission, the obedience we ought to have to the leadership in the church in general and to the leadership over us in our own location in particular. In Jesus' name, make your people strong. Make the church strong. 
and help us, Lord, as we go back home, we'll have a good influence on all our members who have gone astray and uh, they are just talking and talking and uh, derogatory things about the church, about the leadership, and about people. Help us to go and correct even our brothers and sisters in a gentle way when we go back home in Jesus' name. Make your church strong and loving in Jesus' name. In our communities, in our countries, help us to be law-abiding. And help us, Lord, not to speak evil of any man. And if we have anything to say at all, to go to them and see how to help them out. And see our brothers and sisters, our leaders, becoming better through our prayers, through our interaction. Use us in the lives of other people in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. We will be the kind of people, the kind of leaders, the kind of ministers. We ought to be in Jesus' name. Help us that we, leaders, will not run down another leader so as to take their position. Help us, Lord, that we will not in any way do anything to any leader, say anything to about any leader that will make them to be run down so that maybe that way we can exalt ourselves. Help us, Lord, to have the golden rule in our lives, doing unto others as we want others to do unto us. And we pray that your grace will abide upon everyone. And all these uh, people who are here today, their commitment, their endurance, and uh, their attentiveness, just in listening to the word of God, even though they ought to be tired by now, I pray, Lord, you strengthen everyone. Quicken everyone, Lord, in their mortal body. And I pray that nobody will be weak or sick. That your spirit will be energizing everyone every time. And these great, great revelations you are giving us, we will hold on to them and live by them. Be with everyone, Lord. Give everyone good night's rest. That when we come back tomorrow morning, there will be no tiredness at all. In Jesus' mighty name. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't